so uh, this is week three, and uh, we're going to talk mostly about uh, visual art today. And uh, I doubt if we'll get to culinary art. Uh, it's uh, a little bit more that I want to talk about in visual art, I think, to fill up our time. Um, and uh, let me just go to uh, where we were. Let's see. There we go. Um, just at the end of last time, I talked about the surprising thing to neuroscientists, which was uh, when they found that, in fact, the same part of your brain lights up when you listen to a beautiful music uh, as when you look at a beautiful piece of art. And people weren't exactly expecting that for sure. Um, and uh, we're going to go into the art uh, exclusively almost today. Uh, but I hope you'll hear echoes of uh, the music uh, stuff we did. Um, and in fact, those echoes are what I really want to uh, be heading toward. Uh, but now I want to talk not about that exact area. We'll get to that. Why does that area light up? But what's the rest of the brain doing uh, that makes that area say, uh, to activate like crazy and say, that's something beautiful, okay? Um, and the classical view is that beauty starts in visual cortex, of course, would seem natural, where the uh, visual system first uh, takes charge. And uh, I think I showed something like this before. You have specialization that occurs there. So you have... Uh, areas devoted to color, uh, to shapes, um, to line orientations, to distance, all sorts of things like that. And even a face and object recognition area that you can see here. And even an area that's devoted to what kind of movement was that? Recognizing visually what kind of, uh, uh, what did that basketball player uh, just do visually? Um, and if we look at the underside, of your brain, uh, there'll be this kind of uh, object specialization in back here where it says face and object recognition. Then in fact, in most people's brains, uh, the area that you recognize houses is actually somewhat differently it, uh, positioned than how you recognize faces or words, um, for example. And um, they're close by, but you can actually tell the difference when you do the studies. And there's great individual differences. Um, so some people have much larger areas devoted to, for example, recognizing things like houses than to faces or vice versa. And that's been a bit of a surprise. The extreme case is uh, this gentleman here was a website about um, his own face blindness. And that means that he actually does not recognize uh, people by their faces. And it's kind of unusual. So he, um, he exposes it better than anybody else what it's like to live in a world where you don't tell people apart by their faces. He does tell people apart by their voices, by the way they dress, by their haircuts, all sorts of things. He has a normal social life, or mostly normal, um, but he can't, uh, to him, all the faces look the same. They all have two eyes, a nose, a mouth. And it's not that he's blind at all. He can see their faces. But he doesn't have the cortex devoted to recognizing the subtle differences between each of our faces. And so they all look pretty much the same to him. And uh, so that disorder is called prosopagnosia. And now we know they're literally in... Um, you can take an individual and you can spot, this is the area in their brain, they recognize people's faces. As I said last time, the old view was that visual perception and things like visual art would stop, would start there with recognizing color, recognizing shape, recognizing objects, recognizing faces and go up, meaning to more and more complex things like a whole scene or something like that. And we now know that, in fact, that's not the way the brain works, that we have these reciprocal systems. So that, in fact, that bottom-up momentum 
things starting at the lowest level and moving up to higher and higher, more complex figures and so on. Uh, in fact, just as many, and actually in most cases more, um, axons go from the higher level cortex down to the lower cortex. So in fact, there are, there's information flowing from the high parts of your brains down to visual cortex and to where you recognize faces. And I showed this slide before, people like to talk about it as bottom-up processing. So it's um, the part we're just talking about. You take information in at the bottom, at the literally visual cortex, and then you assemble it and integrate it up to uh, high-level uh, percepts like there's, a, there's Lexington. Uh, you also, though, have, and this has become much more important for people to study, top-down. That is, you have expectations in your brain, uh, you have models, ideas in your brain that are part of what makes you smart. And they have this uh, what's called top-down processing mode where they're, you're, you're not waiting for things to hit you in visual cortex. You're actually predicting, this is what I'm gonna see. This is what I'm gonna hear. This is what I'm gonna touch. And that's a profound thing on the way we do everything. And, uh, uh, in, including art. So vision often to people seems bottom up and that's how they feel art is art kind of hits us in the eye. Um, and I wanna argue that in fact, um, that's not the way it is. So here's a kind of famous slide. Um, when you looked at it, you saw Clinton and Gore, but actually if you look closely, you'll see that it's actually Clinton twice with just a different hairdo. And, um, you have built into your nervous system, built in, sorry, learned into your nervous system, an expectation if there's somebody standing behind Bill Clinton and his pictures, it's probably Al Gore and your brain has already anticipated that and makes a guess and then that's the top-down processing happening. And you have to actually pay attention and realize, oh, wait a minute, that's not it. And as a result of this, top-down expectations, you're able to recognize things that are really unclear. Uh, so you can probably recognize both of these, who's in both of these pictures, even though they're incredibly degraded. Um, and uh, Martin Luther King on the left and the Clintons on the right, um, probably you had a good sense. And here's something topical for us. Uh, a lot of people would recognize, oh, I see, that's the Mona Lisa. But if you look at it, it's hardly, um, apparent how your brain would do that, but it's very good at it. So it's always making expectations. Of all the things in the world, this degraded image looks most like the Mona Lisa. That's a top-down thing that your brain is doing all the time. And we're going to be talking uh, today about uh, that the top-down modulations are key to what is actually beautiful. But first I want to talk about that was all what happens in that reddish purple part of your brain. Um, the recognition cortex. How do I recognize things? Both bottom up and top down. In the middle, there's all of what we talked about last time as motor cortex. Um, all of the part of your brain that, of cortex that allows you to take good, successful planned actions on the world. And uh, I wanna just piece it out a little bit. There's sort of three major regions. And right in the big middle here, is typically called premotor cortex. And it's not the part of your cortex that actually moves single muscles or anything like that, but skillful movements. And we talked last time about mirror neurons where you actually um, mirror movements that you see and you mirror them here in motor cortex. So when you watch someone make a movement um, and understand it, and you can do it yourself, um, this part of your brain would light up and mirror it. Would you say, well, I can do that movement. And I showed something like this last time um, to show that in fact, um, it really does happen. The brain uh, fires um, very much just watching someone pick up the, the part of your brain that with which you'd pick up an object fires like crazy when you watch somebody pick it up. And what's, I wanted to show this one, what's startling is that it happens even if they pick up the object behind a screen, which is down toward the bottom, the gray area is the screen. So they don't actually see it. But if they think you're gonna pick up an object, your motor cortex lights up too. 
Okay. And uh, what I think is neat, and just like the music, is that uh, this motor cortex, this premotor cortex, is lighting up, that is, it's active uh, when uh, you're observing uh, a piece of art, visual art. And you sort of, I'm sure some of you were thinking, well, that makes sense when we're listening to music, the kind of going with the beat and tapping your toe and um, thinking of yourself as a violinist, that sort of makes sense in music. But it's also true, turns out, that motor cortex lights up when you're looking at an image. And people have done studies, uh, so they show people this uh, Michelangelo uh, expulsion from paradise, and they say, can you just look over here, and you look at his hand, and sure enough, your hand area of your brain lights up. So when you're looking at Michelangelo and the hand portion of the grasping thing, then uh, the same part of your brain that you would grasp with lights up. And that's kind of, again, all this was surprising when it happened. Now people are sort of assuming, oh, that's the way it works. But it's a remarkable thing that that happens. And lastly, in the very front of your brain, and we've talked about it, but I just want to draw it out more um, dramatically here. Um, we have prefrontal cortex. And this is the latest developing part of our brains evolutionarily. We have far more prefrontal cortex than uh, any other animals, even though other animals have bigger brains. Um, they're late developing, they're, takes all the way to um, adulthood for them to grow. So they're very late evolutionarily and also genetically, which is interesting all by itself. But um, it's the part of the brain that we most think of when we think of who we are and what we care about and what we can do. And in fact, you probably remember the stories of the uh, Phineas Gage who had an accident that blew off his prefrontal cortex and his whole personality changed. He couldn't keep, he was a very good employee, couldn't keep his job after that. Um, and everybody really had a sense that he had, he was no longer Phineas Gage. Other parts of the brain cause blindness or deafness or uh, motor disabilities, whatever. But free, prefrontal cortex is where it feels like that's where you are as much as anywhere else. And that's what it felt like Phineas Gage had become somebody else. Um, okay, so uh, just because we're gonna do a little bit of this, I wanted to say there's a few parts to prefrontal cortex. And overall, it predicts, and we use the, we use the word imagines the future, and then it constructs goals, plans, and strategies to optimize that future. So this is the part of Phineas's brain that would say, well, today I'm gonna get up and go to work. And when he blew a hole through that, he wouldn't get up and go to work. Um, he became an, uh, not a very good employee, obviously. But um, it allows you to predict, this is the day, this is what I'm gonna be doing today, and this is my strategy for getting to work, and so on. Um, it's a very future-oriented part of, uh, all this motor system. And that red part is the part that most does that planning of your actions. So I wanna look at something that is more like art. And uh, here is a famous uh, psychological experiment that was done, this is Giannis's uh, experiment. And uh, it's called the unexpected visitor, doesn't really matter probably what it is, but uh, he took careful eye movement recordings to see where do people look when they look at this. And what he found is this, he could really study the eye movement patterns of people who were looking at this picture. And I want you to just see how different they are, really different patterns. So there's something obviously intentional going on here. And so the question is, why are these so different? And the answer of course could be that they're different people and they have different and they have different goals, they have different interests and so on. But in fact, it's, uh, all of these are from the same person. All that happened was a different question was asked of them. So it might be, how are these people related? What's gonna happen next? You know, is there a cat in the room? Actually, I like to show that one because there it is down at the bottom. If the question is, is there a cat in the room? You have to look everywhere. Could be you know, hanging from the ceiling or whatever. But if the question is more about how are the people related then you choose to mostly look at the people, obviously, and 
mostly at their faces and so on, um, that you make an intentional strategy of how you would look at the painting. And I want to show this because, of course, it's been done many times, but it shows that you don't look at art passively. You look at it with your goal in mind. Why am I looking at this? And um, it's prefrontal cortex that sets that pattern for you, says, well, here's my goal. I want to know how these people related, and here's where I'm going to look. Um, and we'll do that mostly when we look at any painting or any uh, room or whatever. If we cut off that part of the brain, that red part, then it doesn't matter what you ask. The person has lost this prefrontal ability to set goals and to uh, observe according to the question. So they look at the painting the same way each time. And for reasons that I want to talk about, they seem stimulus driven. They're driven by uh, the painting, just what draws attention to the painting itself, not by what their question or their goal is, okay? So they're not uh, expert lookers. When we have uh, the disruption of expectations or something's incongruous or surprising, like um, the Mona Lisa's hair has been done differently, um, all of those are outward signs that we do have an internal model that is exerting top-down effects. That is, you already have a model inside this part of your brain of what to expect. And if you put something new there, then this part of your brain makes an immediate plan for, oh, uh, I gotta look more closely. So uh, we talked about in music, um, the uh, disruption of expectations is a big part of what makes us engage in a painting or in a piece of music. If it's all predictable, we're not interested. If it's all chaos, we're not interested. But if it's just the right of incongruities, just the right amount of surprise, we're drawn to it. And uh, we'll talk about a little bit more about what's that's the case with uh, Mona Lisa. The part that is of interest for just a moment, I wanna go back to the two kinds of smile. And you notice this time that what we call the fake smile is called the prefrontal smile by neuroscientists. Um, and that means that when someone says smile, you're making a plan. You have a goal in mind. You want to smile because you want to be affiliative or because they're gonna take your picture and you wanna look good or whatever it is. But it is a planful, strategic smile. And that's what we see and call the fake smile. And the genuine smile is the smile of just something strikes you as funny or warm or pleasant or friendly or whatever, uh, much deeper in your nervous system. And you have this different kind of smile. And I showed last time that in fact, they look differently. Actors can tell them apart. And uh, certainly um, scientists can tell them apart as the Duquesne and non-Duquesne smile. If you damage prefrontal cortex, you can't do the fake smile. Okay, you have genuine smiles, but you don't have fake smiles anymore. Uh, I can skip that, I think. Okay, so that's prefrontal cortex as the sort of top of the top down way we do things, the most, uh, the highest parts of our nervous system. Last uh, big major division of the nervous system that we talked about music that I want to talk about again is. Uh, the, um, um, often are typically called the emotional systems, the affect, the um, priorities, uh, priority setting, the values of things um, are here in this center of the nervous system. But part of prefrontal cortex that we've talked about a lot is orbital frontal cortex, part of prefrontal cortex, that green part. And that's the part that does the calculating of, well, how good is this? Um, how valuable, how rewarding was that experience? Because you need to know that in order to make good plans. So you have to have a reason for looking at that painting I just showed you. You want to please the experimenter or they're paying you or something like that. Um, but 
in order to plan effectively and live your life effectively, um, you need to know what are the priorities? What do I care about? You know, and when you're hungry, they're going to be different priorities when you're not than when you're not hungry. And orbital frontal cortex is the place that Phineas Gage really got the big blow through um, of that crowbar. And that's what he couldn't do anymore. He couldn't prioritize anymore. He didn't know it was important to get up and go to work uh, and be regular and all those things. And that's why people found him as not the same person because he didn't value the same things. He wasn't um, friendly in the same ways. He was impulsive and all sorts of things, but he mainly just didn't have um, uh, the values that people associated with him anymore. Okay. Uh, and we talked about the reward circuit and that is both bottom up and top down. That is your plans and your uh, imagining of the future can affect um, how you feel about things that are happening to you now. And similarly, when something good happens, it attracts the attention of your prefrontal cortex. Say, wow, something good happened. Uh, pay attention and let's do, uh, let's do something to have that happen again. So this orbital frontal cortex is the part of your front of your brain that's most connected to all of that rewarding stuff, the value stuff that happens in your brain, uh, sex, food, um, money, all of those things are tracked here in orbital frontal cortex to say, ah, oh, those things are important. Uh, let's make a plan where we can do more of those. Okay. And that turns out to be the very place that we've been talking about. And there it is where uh, you're able to say that was important. That was good. I like that. Um, and uh, that's that orbital frontal cortex we saw lighting up when um, you look at a painting that you call beautiful or when you listen to Beethoven's Eroica, if you think it's beautiful. And um, people have done lots of studies to show that in fact, um, if people rank the intensity of the beauty, how beautiful is it? Uh, people have done studies to show that the amount of intensity of the firing in orbital frontal cortex and specifically that dopamine rush we talked about is roughly correlated. That is the more active it is in this pleasurable parts of your brain, things that are tracking uh, pleasure and good things happening, the more active that is, the more intensely you say something is beautiful. So these things are quite well linked, not perfectly, but quite well linked. And this part of the cortex, uh, we've been talking about, there it is again, if you in fact stimulate it, um, if you excite it with a little extra electricity, um, the, uh, that will make you judge paintings as more beautiful. And by the way, well, let me finish that. So if we stimulate it, get it sort of hyper excited with electricity, then you go, oh, I really love that. You, you find that it's a more intense beauty. And as you probably will not be surprised, if we damage that part of your brain, or if we drug it, or do things to uh, decrease its activity, you don't find things as beautiful. I wanna be clear that now we're talking about beauty, not just pleasure, that people will describe it as not as beautiful if we uh, make it so this part can't operate effectively. And similarly, if we make it hyperactive, if we give it dopamine drugs, you will find things more beautiful. So that's part of um, the way in which we um, uh, identify beauty, um, feel beauty. Um, lots of things make a difference in terms of whether we, in fact, find a particular painting beautiful. And I'm not going to go through all of these because they're the same as in music. It really matters what your anatomy is like. Is this part of your brain really connected well to visual cortex? If it is, you're more likely to experience um, uh, feelings of beauty. And similarly, the chemistry, we talked about it um, in music, but if we give you more um, uh, dopamine stimulating drugs, uh, you will find things more beautiful, so on. 
and genes make a difference. We inherit brains that are somewhat different. And similarly, culture makes a big difference. It's not just the makeup of your brain uh, that you inherited, but it's the makeup of your brain that you um, developed in culture. So different cultures will uh, uh, shape your brain to in fact uh, find that beauty in different kinds of paintings, uh, different kinds of music and so on and so forth. So how you develop is a big um, aspect, uh, what things are around you. And I wanna get into that quite a bit in a minute. Um, I wanted to look this up to make sure. Um, so this is the, what happens when you listen to a dirge or a really sad piece of music? You will often say some of the, you know, Mozart's Requiem or something you know, is among the most beautiful pieces anywhere. But is that going to have this same area light up? Because it's mostly positive things. And uh, here's, a read this line, um, you know, beautiful and sad, beautiful and joyful, ugly, neutral, ugly. The medial orbital frontal cortex was active during the experience of both kinds of beauty. Otherwise, they engaged other parts of the brain, but the part that was the same, if you said it was sad, but beautiful, this orbital frontal cortex lights up. So that too was a surprise to people um, that this part of your brain is really about beauty, not just happiness. And um, I don't think that was intuitive to anybody. These are more recent experiments. Um, I wanted to highlight something, a, a book that I would recommend if you wanna really study um, this reward system. And particularly the thing I talked about briefly, the difference between liking something and wanting it. And uh, so this is a book really about dopamine. And the book's argument is largely that dopamine is a molecule of the wanting. What this dopamine system is that's right here in orbital, fort orbital frontal cortex is the part of your brain that most drives you to want something more, not just to like it. Oh, that was pleasant but I want that, I want more of that. I want to come back and see it. I want to pay money for it. Um, so this book is a long treatise on uh, dopamine and how you can see the text here. They say, of course, it's the most important thing in the whole brain. Uh, lots of people wouldn't agree with that exactly, but it's a very pivotal thing. This whole reward circuit, this whole orbital frontal cortex evaluation of things is a very determining part of who we are. And um, when things go awry with it, we either don't find enough pleasure or in the case of stimulating drugs, we find too much pleasure and so on. I talked last time and it's key that drug addicts are mostly driven by the wanting. This part of the brain, I want it, I want it, I want it. And by the time they're really addicted, they are less and less likely to say, I like it. Very different things. Um, so dopamine here, enough of that. Um, and Parkinson's, as I mentioned last time, is a disease that's a loss of um, dopamine, but dopamine has a few things it does. One is motor, that's what you notice. Um, and then there's this striking phenomena of people with dopamine, uh, with Parkinson's becoming uh, artistic. And um, the thing that it turns out to be true is that in fact, it's not the Parkinson's, it's the dopamine uh, that they're getting as a treatment that is making them into valuing art. Um, so there'll be people who will literally draw and paint or do music obsessively because they want, they want the art, they want to make it. And people mistakenly thought for decades that it was some aspect of Parkinson's, but it's really the dopamine, the wanting chemical, the more chemical. Um, and here's just a one, um, what's the one experiment of many to show um, that if you put people in a scanner, um, 
they do indeed have that orbital frontal cortex light up more, find things more beautiful when they're things from their own culture, if their culture is different. Um, so culture has a big effect on what you will describe as beautiful, it has the same impact, that is its orbital frontal cortex, but the rest of your brain is shaped by your culture to say, this is what we like, this is what our culture values, and your brain picks that up, and uh, orbital frontal cortex will then uh, fire to say, oh, that's beautiful, given how I've uh, been raised, okay? Uh, so we have those differences. So now I want to get to the heart of it, which is, is beauty mostly bottom up or mostly top down? And there's the sort of start of the bottom up comes in and you recognize things. And much of art history and art classes um, have focused on the perceptual properties of things. What makes something beautiful? And they'll talk about things like the golden uh, rectangle and uh, uh, things about proportion that are beautiful. And uh, I just picked this slide because it's interesting that they had two things, the Parthenon and the Mona Lisa to say, mm, this is the golden ratio. And uh, good art, beautiful art uses the golden ratio strongly, okay? And the history of Western civilization was a lot of that kind of view that it's something in the object itself. There's something proportional, there's something about the colors, the way they balance each other, all of those things. They're peripheral things um, in the object that in fact make it beautiful. And uh, here's more of this analysis looking at to say, ah, there's a golden ratio right there in her face. Now, when I look at that, I think, wow, you could have drawn that square in lots of ways. Um, so this gets a little overhyped in my opinion. But anyway, this is the way people often see it. Here was a whole talk talking about the golden ratios in Mona Lisa's face um, and how perfect it is and all of that. Um, so this um, seems uh, too hard for me because I haven't been an art student. And so some of you are artists and you know this, there are things that we know about how to use shape, proportion, color, et cetera, to make things that are more likely to, for people to find beautiful. Um, but I'm gonna be arguing that those are not the most important things. And I want to get back a little bit to Mona Lisa. So um, this is a nice video that I'm not going to take the time to do today, but um, it's, it's a good one. Great art explained in 15 minutes. And the guy has an English accent and everything, and he sounds smart. And it's uh, uh, 15 minutes of what makes the Mona Lisa great. And this is a line from his uh, video. A port this is a portrait that is the greatest psychological portrait ever painted a portrait so ahead of its time, the centuries later, we are still trying to figure it out. There's a couple of things I want to draw out. Um, one is like the Beethoven we talked about, it was ahead of its time. And also like the Beethoven, there was puzzling things about it. There was discontinuity, dis discongruities that are very much part of what makes the Mona Lisa uh, such a dominant, um, uh, painting. And in fact, there are studies by people who will say, see there, that's what um, Leonardo has done to draw your attention to her face. Um, and it's part of uh, the object here. Um, a couple things uh, that I want to notice, though, is that in that beautiful video, he talks about what was surprising here. And there's a lot of things that are surprising. Here's the way most uh, portraits looked at that time. They're very different. They're highly stylized. They have lots of jewelry and uh, they're full bodied and all that. So this is already a very different image. And we don't sort of, because we're in the 21st century, we don't recognize how different it was. But his point is this is startlingly different than what people uh, were accustomed to seeing in portraiture in the same way that the Oracle was, but it's still 
has a lot of the traditional things a portraiture does. So it's different enough to intrigue someone. Uh, by the way, among things, she's very uh, plainly dressed. Um, she's much closer than the portraits of that time were. So you're really drawn into her face, not only by the triangulation, but by the limited range you have to see here. Other people smarter than me will talk about, uh, I never noticed it. If you'll notice the background actually is in two different levels. On the left, it's a lower horizon than on the right. It's like, you think this was done by a, you know, high school portraitist who didn't pay attention to the, well, the background's got to line up behind her. But the argument, because of course we have sketches and all of that, is that um, Leonardo knew exactly what he's doing and he wanted to create this movement to draw you right through her face. And so he made this curving background to go off there and it um, actually adds tension in the painting, exactly what he wanted. One thing he was is incredibly intentional. So um, he messes with the background to say, I got to draw your attention to the face. So people who know a lot about art, know about all that sort of thing. There it is. You can see how dramatically different if you look closely, the two backgrounds are. Looks like a mistake, um, but not a mistake. Uh, so like Beethoven's Eroica, um, the Mona Lisa broke many expectations. She wasn't dressed right. She's much too close. Background's weird. Um, all sorts of things. No, no jewelry. Um, but it kept close enough that people could see this is a this is a portrait. Um, and this discongruity is part of what draws us into this. There's something different about it, just different enough, like the Eroica was, that we have to look more. We're going to get to the smile in a second, but. Uh, the one on the right, I showed that at the beginning last time to say, hmm, I can sometimes show that your unconscious brain has already figured out there's something weird about this picture. It's not right. All that does is show the top-down effects. Inside your brain, you are predicting all the time what it should be. Okay, so I like this. This is a painting and it's called America's Most Wanted, America's Most Wanted Painting. And what they did was they took a survey of what people like and would want in their paintings. And then they put them all in one painting, the top ones. Okay, so this is the kind of thing you do to say to art students, okay, A, you can't pay attention to your consumer for getting your inspiration entirely, and uh, that it isn't something as simple as you have a lot of popular things and put them in that the way in which you construct this that Leonardo did is going to be very vital to making it an interesting page. So all of that is something to do with the uh, painting itself. The fun stuff comes um, with the top down stuff. Um, I think I'll skip that it just says what I'm about to say. Top-down stuff is pretty important. So we've already seen a couple examples where visually top-down stuff is hard at work and you're predicting and um, uh, either the dress, what color it is or who's standing behind Bill Clinton. Um, now I wanna look at top-down things that make a difference whether this part of your brain will light up. And some of them are, of course, striking. So some of you may have heard of this. This is a famous incident. It's called, Where Should We Go Dancing Tonight? A um, piece of um, conceptual art, perhaps, um, that was in, the, in a gallery in Italy. Uh, it became famous. Okay, so this is the, um, what's the word? This is the museum room. You come and that's what you see. Um, and- What's that? An installation. It's an installation. Thank you. That's the right word. An installation. And um, what made it famous was that uh, that night um, the cleaners came in. To them, it looked like rubbish and they cleaned it all up. Um, and that has to do with that top down thing. 
the people who came to the museum and paid their money thought top down, this is art. So no one thought of putting it in the rubbish. The cleaning people came in with a very different top down impression of what was in the room, a mess that needs to be cleaned up. Um, and that for me is as good an example of, it means a lot to think you're looking at art as opposed to something else, whether that orbital frontal cortex will light up. And you've seen lots of examples like this. So this is Duchamp's um, advance, of the broken, advance of the Broken Arm. The shovel on the left is a piece of art. The shovel on the right is a, a piece that um, uh, just a, was picked up at the hardware store and took a picture of it. And here is Duchamp's shovel hanging in a gallery now famously um, because people came to the gallery to see this um, spectacular work of art um, and not to the hardware store. A top-down thing again, if you go into the hardware store, you're not primed, you don't have the expectations, you're gonna see great art. Um, but if you go into a museum, you do. And people then have orbital frontal cortex light up brightly um, to uh, Duchamp's um, shovel. And perhaps the alternate most famous one is, I don't know how to say his name, I'm sorry, Malevich's black square. Uh, and this is his description of it. The first time someone made a painting that wasn't of something. So it's often considered the um, first really uh, prominent abstract painting. It's just a black square. It's been kind of uh, dappled by time, but I mean, just a black square. And uh, for Malevich, uh, it was in fact um, an important, very important, eroica like advance in art. Up until now, there were no attempts at painting as such without any attribute of real life. Painting was the aesthetic side of a thing, but never was original and an end in itself. In the year 1913, trying desperately to free art from the dead weight of the real world, I took refuge in the form of the square. So it's now, of course, very valuable and very famous, but that is a top-down piece of art. If you don't come in thinking a bunch of things, i.e. about the history of art that you've already, just like Beethoven's audience, you already know a lot about art. You can see where it's headed and you're ready for Malevich. A lot of people were not ready for Malevich, of course, and said, where's the cows and the scenery? Um, but for people who are schooled in art, um, they got it. They said, oh my God, this is beginning of something new. And he calls it uh, suprematism, um, all about the supremacy of color and shape in painting. By sticking to simple geometric shapes and a limited range of colors, he could focus on the painting itself and not be distracted by representing a scene or landscape or person. Getting to the, for him, getting to the heart of painting, but really he's getting to the heart of prefrontal cortex. You have to come in with high expectations that this is gonna be art. Um, otherwise it looks like something that people uh, left on the porch. Um, that kind of art is clearly top down. And for some of you, this is probably totally obvious, but for me in preparing for these lectures it was the first time I'd really thought about the spectrum between things that come entirely from the painting or the art up through visual cortex in that bottom up way and can be beautiful and stimulating and things that come entirely from prefrontal cortex and all of those expectations. You have to know about art and you have to know this piece in the uh, overall um, scenery of art. And you have to have expectations about it, all of those things. It's 
not in fact coming from visual cortex at all. In fact, there's probably, I bet you there's installations that are called invisible art. Uh, Ruth will later tell me, but there's probably ones where you come to a blank room and you see the art there in just that the artist kept it blank. But the that wonderful uh, uh, after the party uh, comes pretty close to that. It's actually more interesting than that though too. Um, that um, what else in this top-down way determines whether you see something as beautiful. And people have done these experiments to actually test them and looked at, almost literally, we'll look at the same things we've been talking about. Well, what lights up orbital frontal cortex? And it turns out it matters, as I've been saying, whether you think it's art, whether someone tells you it's art, whether you decide it's art, that makes a huge difference. So this one's derivative of that. If you see it in a museum, that means somebody thinks it's art. Hopefully people that know a lot, or I don't know if it's hopefully, by people who know a lot, they say it's art. And that makes it much more likely that you're going to um, think it's beautiful, okay? And there's experiments that do this. Um, and people literally take the image and uh, a neural image and they'll look at the same thing in a gallery or on your computer or uh, you know in various other non-gallery uh, museum things and yep and look where it says this the modulation correlated with the activity in the medial orbital frontal cortex and prefrontal cortex that makes the difference if it's in a museum your medial orbital frontal cortex, or just say orbital frontal cortex, is much more likely to say it's beautiful. And that's not with you having words or anything. It's more likely to light up as something beautiful. This is the first time the black square was shown in the gallery. And you can tell that Malevich thought he was onto something. He placed it really uniquely, the only painting that was put in this odd position of all of his other works because um, he felt this is my this is my ne plus ultra um, I can't speak French but anyway um, and uh, there it is that's how it showed other things determine from the outside world this top-down way what is said in the title next to it there are studies of what does it mean that you look at the title and that little description that's next to the picture. And that does in fact determine, not completely, affects whether you find it beautiful or not. The title itself, the description, why is the description? Because the description often gives you context to say, this is a, um, uh, this is a, a riff on uh, somebody else's painting and uh, except that in this case, he's done it with da 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 da. And you go, oh, I see, top down. I understand it. Now I see that is beautiful. That's really interesting. Okay. So even the titles, I just, I hope it's, uh, it's probably too obvious, but this is not coming from the painting itself. This is coming from your brain um, via the title or via the fact that you're in a museum or all of these things. They're not the painting itself. They affect whether you see it as beautiful. Um, and that's the experiment. They've done experiments now to say that. Now I'll skip them now, but it really made a difference whether, and it, sure enough, it's in orbital frontal cortex. And the same is true if they did a fake experiment where they got people to kind of hang around a picture and talk about it and go, oh, that one's beautiful. And sure enough, your orbital frontal cortex is more likely to light up unless you're a cantankerous person like some people in our church who would just, that would immediately set them off to think I'm not gonna like this. But anyway, for um, many people that in fact makes orbital frontal cortex light up more. And you won't be surprised and you'll be aggravated to know that in fact, if you put a price tag next to it, say this is a $15 million painting, um, then your orbital frontal cortex is much more likely to light up and say, yeah, I see, that is beautiful, okay? Now you can either see that as something really degrading and awful, or, no, that's the only way to see it, actually. Anyway, um, 
Uh, that's the experiment to just show that. Um, and then something I mentioned I'd want to talk about today is here's two Rembrandt-like things. One's a fake and one's real. And they did a really nice job with the experiment. They showed that in fact, in visual cortex, highest levels of visual cortex and up through the rest of the brain, there's no difference. You uh, can't, uh, you don't see these as, as different, okay? Everybody with me? Um, but then they ran the experiment where they just randomly said one was authentic Rembrandt and one was just fake Rembrandt. And I just love this, look at this. The only region activated by telling them whether it was authentic or not was orbital frontal cortex. If not in visual cortex, not anywhere else. Orbital frontal cortex lights up when you know that this one's authentic because you say, ah, I'm going to like that one. And in fact, if uh, you, you find that it's depressed uh, for the um, inauthentic one, and your brain starts problem solving, trying to figure out, oh, what's inauthentic about it? Okay, uh, so people rate as more beautiful things that are done by um, an authentic artist. That's really key. It's a, I'm gonna say later, it's really a communication that's being set up here. You want to know that a person, an authentic artist has made this and has intent they intend to do something with this, and you're picking up that intent. It's a top-down kind of thing. It's not the colors or the shapes or something. You're looking at what is behind this painting in the same way that you're driven to know what was Leonardo doing? Why that smile? Why that broken um, uh, background? What is he trying to do here? Um, and the same with uh, if it's an amateur or a computer did it, an animal did it, you've seen those elephant paintings, a forge or a child, you rate those as less beautiful. And I love this title, Beauty is in the Prefrontal Cortex of the Beholder, a fairly recent article. Um, and there's a way in which that's very significantly true. It is not entirely true, but you are creating beauty with all of those pieces we've just been talking about, your culture, what other people are saying about it. Um, uh, is it uh, authentic? Is it done by a real artist who's put work into making it? All of those things make a difference in, in its larger context in history. Where is this relation to other paintings right now? All of those things are prefrontal things that you're doing. And, in preparation for this, um, I was just telling Ruth this, uh, I have often talked about my own change as a consumer of art. Um, that's an exaggeration. I'm not really a consumer of art. Um, but I was in college, incredibly undereducated, and um, I took the you know required Fine Arts 13, which was a year long introduction to fine arts. I took it largely because it was not that hard, um, but it was a great course, well known as a great course. Um, it was called Darkness at Noon by most people because uh, it would be slideshows with lots of art. Anyway, I was one of those people that thought abstract art was a complete joke. Um, you know, the usual type person that thought my child could have made that. You know, you could throw paint up there and it would be just as good and so on. And uh, a show came, to the, this was at Harvard College, and a show came to the museum, the Fog Art Museum, many of you have seen, by these three painters, Nolan, Olitsky, and Stella. I didn't know who any of them were, of course. But I had a section person who was really good. And he could tell that I was at least, what should I say, a nice guy and not an alien force. And he kind of spent a little time talking to me uh, to help me you know, make this bridge from really representational art to what was then quite unusual. And um, so I went to the show finally at the Fog because it wasn't very far. And 
I was in fact blown away. I just thought it was gorgeous. Now it took all of that preparation, a full year of Fine Arts 13 and a section person who was willing to give me a little more extra before I went in for me to like it. But I got a legitimate dopamine rush. I, could, I didn't know what dopamine was, but I felt you know, the hair on my skin stand up and my uh, skin sweat and all of those things. I felt I was trans, not transported in some way is maybe a little too strong, but I was moved. And I hope you're paying attention to all those parts. My motor cortex was moved. I was thinking, how were these made? I was looking at what is he intending to do here? What is all of this? Anyway, I like it that the book of this uh, exhibit is on sale at the at Amazon. It's still there. It was it turns out it was a big show. I didn't know that. And the Harvard, I look now up, you know, to get ready for this talk and you know, the bowels of the Harvard Crimson. And uh, here's the review by somebody named Robert a Abrams, who I actually think I know, but anyway. Um, and he said it was Harvard's first exhibition of significant contemporary painting. Now at the fog, blah, blah, blah. But look at the last uh, paragraph, I love it. As with a piece of music, the viewer must react to the abstract qualities of a non-representational art with a willingness to be moved. Like rhythm, melody, and harmony in music, coloristic special structural themes are the essentials of this art. An appreciation of these qualities requires a substantial span of time before the canvas. I love he's making the connection to music. Uh, and that's the way I felt. I, I did know music. Um, I played an instrument and I felt moved. There was something <laughs> melodic about this whole thing that was a surprise to me. And I love it that this, uh, you know, another undergrad wrote in this way. Um, but these were giant, abstract, completely abstract paintings that were, uh, that were heroic alike. They were, um, for the people who knew art, it was all like, great, finally you get, we get Stella here in a crappy old museum. But for people like me, it was just far enough ahead that I was really moved. Last, I'm just gonna do two minutes and we'll be done. Um, where does art begin? It begins up here in these medial prefrontal orbital frontal cortex. When you start to paint, you start to paint here. That is with, this is the feeling I want. This is the feeling I'm having. This is what I want to convey. I'm not just trying to draw lines. I want to convey something. So that's where an artist typically, draw, you know, the reason I'm saying it carefully is you can't stick people in an fMRI machine and ask them to draw beautiful art because it's too weird. So we actually have to guess that that's what's happening. Um, you just can't, you know, later they'll have uh, mobile head things and we can see what an artist really looks like as they first start to paint. Uh, I wanted to uh, say near the end here that, um, this whole thing about effort, seeing that there was an artist involved, I love it that Malevich actually painted four versions of the black square. You think, well, how hard is it to draw a black square? But for him, it was very hard. He was intending to do something. He was motivated with that wonderful emotional prefrontal cortex. He wanted to convey that emotion that he was feeling about this transition, this powerful thing he was doing. And so he wrote, he made four versions and you can tell because they've done analysis of what's under them. And the first one was all colored and stuff like that. Um, so he took great effort to make this. So this is not just something he did quickly um, at all. I like that. And Leonardo clearly painted with prefrontal cortex, it was intentional. He knew what he was doing. He made the smile um, so that it was just out of your, um, ease of knowing what it was so that you kept drawing in. But the same with the background, the same with the way he used um, shadows. He was saying, I need to grab you and pull you in because I want to say something about this woman that's never been said before. And, um, and that same movie I talked about earlier says, it's the most, uh, still the most psychologically adept portrait in the history of art. I have no idea whether that's true or not. But I do know that Leonardo took years to paint it. 
not just the smile, but the whole thing took years and years. The only painting he took when he left Italy and went to France, it's that painting he took. So he knew this was an important painting about what he wanted to say. And the audience gets it. Um, there's something about this that draws us in. Um, and the key thing is that he painted with orbital prefrontal cortex. He was not a drafts person. He wasn't drawing with motor cortex. He was drawing with orbital prefrontal cortex. He wanted to get the feeling right. And just the last line, I, th I think what's neat about art to me is it takes two prefrontal orbital co cortexes to make art. The painter who needs to have something they really want to convey, and largely that's emotion rather than perfection of any kind. And the art goer um, joins with their prefrontal cortex, orbital frontal cortex to say, I want to feel what you're, um, why you took so much work to do this painting. And so it really takes two orbital prefrontal cortexes to make art is what I think. Anyway, um, end of our time for today. Uh, I'm gonna see if there are any questions um, by getting out of this. And um, I see Omar, I just wanna see if I can get a better view so I can see more people. I hate it that I can't see people. Oh, good, I can see more people. Uh, and if any of you are there and have been having your names up and not your pictures because you've uh, been cooking or uh, painting, I would love to see your faces. Just it makes a big difference to me uh, during this discussion anyway. Uh, so, uh, Omar, did you raise your hand with a question or just an annoyance? Okay, okay, go. Um, uh, uh, great, great talk, David. Um, and I also wanted to remind people that um, if they use the reactions button at the bottom of the screen, um, they can then raise their hand that way and we can call on people one by one. But um, I wanted to ask you, um, forgive me, you know, for sounding skeptical, but it seems like these tools that are being used to figure out what's going on in the brain are still really, really primitive. Is there anything like on the horizon where, you know, we'll be able to get like more information than this, you know, there's activity in this region type of, yeah. type of information. It's sort of like, you know, way, way long ago before there was, you know, an anatomy, you know, like prodding the body and trying to figure out what's going on inside the body by saying, oh, if you press too hard here, the patient dies, you know. Yeah. Is, there, is there anything coming along that? So there would be two views of this, I think, uh, Omar, good question. One would be by the neuroscientists. Yeah, we just need better tools. And other people, the humanists like me probably would say, no, we just need better ways to talk to people and ask them, <laughs> you know, that there's a limit to how much um, we want to anatomize uh, something like beauty. Um, mm. I think that um, I still want to, I mean, I think it's remarkable that we do feel chills. I mean, that is just astonishing. And uh, that takes, um, body's energy to go through all that, to make those things happen. So we've kept it as an evolutionary species to, to want to have a reaction strong enough to beauty that we're willing to devote cortex to it. And we're willing to devote uh, amygdala to it and all of these things, um, I think is the valuable thing. What's worth studying the neuroscience is that there have been some surprises where you go, oh, I didn't think of it that way. And I'll be sending out a, a couple of readings for people to go further. Um, and one is a, just a recent one by a, the gentleman who started all this, Zeki, Z-E-K-I, where he's taking a, oh, sorry, no, it's a YouTube video. I'll be sending out YouTube videos. And it's where he's interviewed about, and he's, and he's a person who knows art. Um, and I think it's a wonderful dialogue between the neuroscience part of him and the art loving part of him. Uh, so I'll make sure I share that with everybody. Um, but anyway, so I wouldn't say that, I'd say there are things we cannot learn by looking at the brain, no matter how good the tools are. 
um, because these are emergent properties. Beauty is something that emerges out of this wonderfully complicated thing that we have, but it's not the thing itself, you know? Uh, and I think that's why beauty is more fun to study than, you know, galvanic skin responses. Um, that probably didn't answer your question. That was probably more evasive than anything else. Is that right? Do you want to follow up, Omar? Or no, no, that's great. Okay. All right. So I saw some other hands. Um, I think Suzanne uh, is next. But what, uh, either Omar or Ruth, you you guys tell me who I should answer. I see hands. Suzanne. Suzanne. All. Okay, Suzanne, go. Oh, you're muted, Suzanne. Okay. Um, I just want to ask you if finding something beautiful in terms of the brain is the same as finding it fascinating, because I, that's what I often find when I look at a piece of art. I wouldn't necessarily say, oh, that's so beautiful, but I would say, I really am wondering what the artist is doing, and isn't this intriguing? So. Great question. Um, and uh, in fact, Zeki sort of is puzzling with that same question. Um, um, because what the orbital frontal cortex is doing is valuing. And we as humans describe it when we see art as beauty. But if you, sh oh, I just realized one part of an answer, Suzanne, would be that I'm not covering, but I see people out there in this audience that would be able to do this. People find beauty in mathematics. And uh, that feels like, whoa, is that, maybe that'd be completely different. Well, it's the same area lights up when you feel beauty in the equation. That is so incredible to me. Um, but um, the blurred edge with something about, it's just intensely interesting. I think mathematics brings that up for me because I'm not into math. I would never find it beautiful, but I could see that I would find it fascinating enough that this same orbital frontal cortex would light up because it's saying, this is really valuable. This is really good. This is pleasurable. And sometimes that might even happen for me with someone showing me something in math. And I think that has maybe happened actually. Um, so the beauty only comes in, uh, Suzanne, because all of the experimenters are asking people to say that word and use it. But if they said, this is intensely interesting, there would be quite a bit of overlap would be my guess. Or if you said intent, and certainly if you said intensely moving, it would be a large amount of overlap. Um, so fascinating, fascination would be very close to here. This is the part of the brain that's saying, this is worth, in fact, remember that distinction between wanting and liking. This is the part of the brain that says, I want more of this, whatever it is. Whatever that was, I wanted more of it. Art, mathematics, I want more. Okay, I see, uh, oh, lots of people, I love it. Don Jansen, oh my God, you could do the math part. I, th I think Nancy was next. Nancy. Oh, okay. Next. Unmute. I did, just took me a minute because my motor cortex was not working very well. Yeah. Well, you were too um, fascinated. I, I was. Um, so I have two questions. One was about Phineas Gage because that was fascinating to me. The, which and one? About Phineas Gage, the oh. man with no frontal cortex. Mm -hmm. And so does that mean he would be unable to experience beauty? Well, I don't know the answer for sure, um, but the crowbar went right up through his orbital frontal cortex. So. Um, I would be willing to bet Ruth's part of the mortgage that he would not be going to art galleries. Um, that that would not be, he wouldn't get enough pleasure out of that. You know, I'm gonna look that up though, Nancy. I, I, I wonder if, it, if anybody asked him ever. He was alive for quite a while. And um, the other thing is, you know, I, I think I know the answer, but I just want your confirmation is um, the same part of the brain would light up for words. If you thought certain words or a poem or 
writing or things like that were beautiful. I'm, I'm eager to talk with Cammie. Those of you that are in First Parish you know Cammie's our sort of um, poet in residence and teaches us a lot about poetry. I'd love to do this same kind of um, investigation uh, with poetry. Um, I would be shocked if you didn't, when you say that poem is beautiful, if the same part of the brain uh, didn't, I'd be, uh, I'd be shocked. And Reggie can tell you right now. Is Reggie here too? Yeah. So Reggie, that probably makes sense to you, right? Which part about the part of the brain lighting up when you hear poetry? Poetry, poetry would have the same effect. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's also some studies about the auditory um, portions of the brain, which light up as well, especially if something is rhythmic. Um, there's a book, um, Paul, I'm trying to remember his name, read it a long time ago. It's called Shakespeare and Neuroscience. Mm. And it's, it's, um, it's, it's all about people going into MRI machines and all of that and listening to the works of William Shakespeare and the parts of the brain which are lighting up as a result of that. Well, I don't um, know. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. If I could find it around here, I'll loan it to you. But yeah, Shakespeare and uh, neuroscience. I'm trying to remember the exact name. I'll put it out. You know what? I'll look it up again and put it up in the chat. Oh, fabulous! And I sure. see, I see, he's right behind you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He he's, he does that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, we have we have a very eclectic church. <laughs> That's great. I don't know that book. Yeah, I'll look it up and and put it in the chat. Uh, okay, so go ahead, uh, Omar. Who's next? Don Yansen's next. Okay, Don. Um, David, uh, the, referring to uh, the Parkinson's um, people that you talked about, that uh, they first noticed increased cre creativity, but then it they determined it was from the medication. Has any experiments been done with other uh, cognitive brain disorders uh, that might be helped by the create, at least creativity might be helped by that kind of medication? Um, I just wanna make sure I understand the question. Um, uh, Trying to think of another disorder that might be helped by dopamine. Um, here's what I would say, Don, but then follow up if I don't answer right. That it seems pretty clear that is there are lots of neurotransmitters, and some of them would have no effect on creativity whatsoever. Um, it's not just like any neurotransmitter would make you uh, be more creative or get into art. Um, it's that dopamine pleasure thing, and especially the wanting, I want to be able to create more pleasure, you know, for myself and others, uh, that right. will make them literally practice. So what I'm trying to think of is if I know any other neurological disorders for which dopamine is the treatment of uh, uh, pre-dopamine uh, pre things, and I don't, I'll have to think about it, Don. Um, yeah, maybe we talk later, yeah. Yeah, um, but so I would say that if you take dopamine for uh, L-dopa, whatever the, the precursors are, um, for whatever you're taking, for a cold, um, that you would have that boost, um, that that's, you know, that's an incredibly powerful um, part of your brain. And um, if you increase the amount of dopamine, you're gonna have more pleasure. I mean. Oh, I know what, Don, you know this, I, but I can fake it, excuse me, fake it by giving you, you know, street drugs. And sure enough, um, you find um, that you are more pleasured by all sorts of things. Um, and the problem is that it is so powerful when you give it as a straight drug that it overcomes the sort of natural things of like making art or you know having time with your friends the things that should be pleasurable to you that the drug goes bypasses the rest of your brain just says hey, no we're just going to give it to you right there uh, a lot of dopamine and the dopamine rush becomes so powerful 
and that, again, it's that wanting thing. That's all you want. You just like, and as you know, and in fact, you can do it with. Yeah, uh, well, I was of uh, actual disorders where the uh, person doesn't want normal things at the same level. So it's kind of bringing it back up, whether, you know, could bring it back up to a normal level. But anyway, uh, th thanks. Ah. <laughs> it, oh, that's a little bit different. Um, I better look it up, up, but certainly there are, there are studies of depression and art and treatments of that. Um, and I will talk about that next week, actually. Um, so maybe that'll get close to what you want, Don. Um, is, that, is that closer? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, there are treatments for, uh, there's a word for it, Don, called anhedonia, which is a person who doesn't feel pleasure, um, literally. And then there's various kinds of depression. Um, and uh, we'll talk about those actually next week. Yeah. Thanks for asking. I forgot about that. I think Carolyn Fleiss is next. Uh oh, a real artist. <laughs> um, hello? Hi. Hello. Can you see me? Yep, we got gotcha. you. Oh, yeah. Um, thank you for that comment, David. Uh, I put something in the chat. Can you read that? <laughs> I probably can. That's my that's my that's my question. It's it's really asking you to comment on my experience. Is it there? It's actually not in the chat. No, I see it. I, I'm I sent seeing it, to it. David. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'd be happy to have dinner with you tonight. Yes, Carolyn. <laughs> um, no, that's not what it's about. Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, can I just summarize it to the uh, folks? It's sure. well, she just finished an intensive color theory class uh, with lots of exercises. And she says, total loss as to what it has to do with making art. Uh, interesting, but what has it to do with what's happening in my brain? Uh, something else has to get stimulated in order to make me feel moved to great art. And, and that's exactly my point of this lecture that all of the color theory and the golden triangles and all of that are part, you know, the sort of what an artist can use, but they don't get to why artists make art. Um, and you could have, in fact, if you gave me all the color theory and all of the proportional exercises and all of the things that train artists, I would still not be an artist um, because I lack the things I've been talking about, uh, which is that great desire, mm. along with the fluency in how I can be an artist. But when I say the art came from this orbital frontal prefrontal cortex, that's not color, <laughs> that's emotion. <laughs> you know, that's something I want to be able to do. And that will drive me to learn color theory and to learn proportionality and all sorts of things. You can't get there in a, I would say, you can't get there in a bottom up way. You can't just study all the tools of artistry and then all of a sudden become an artist. I right. think, yeah. And that's why, uh, in fact, yeah. And that's why Don's question is right. And so we need to talk about it. That is, which is more damn, oh, that's a great question. What's more damaging to an artist to lose all of their skills or even to become blind or to have the damage in the parts that I've been talking about, orbital frontal cortex. And I would say the latter is what would make them not be an artist anymore. That is, I've seen, because I have a lot of disability work, I've seen people who've changed completely the medium they work in because they can't use their hands anymore. And they now can only make art with their feet or whatever. And, or they are blind and they can't use color, um, but you can still make art <laughs> and they just need to find a new medium. And I think that's, that's the way it goes. So when you're creating art, um, color theory is a vehicle, but it's not the art. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, if you don't have an emotional 
uh, some kind of an emotional connection to what you're trying to create, you can't do it. It just yeah. it doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I firmly believe you could give me all the skills and I still would not be an artist because um, it's not the way I can express my emotions. Um, I'd be better. Um, okay, let me see. Thank you. Um, Thank you. I think Sarabri is next. Oh, uh, two artists in a row. This is really scary. Do have time? Yes. So my question is still struggling with beauty and pleasure and art um, connection. Um, you mentioned placement of the art makes a big difference. Um, I'm struggling with that because a true piece of artwork works by itself. And I think what happens if you place it in a museum or in, even if you have a certain background, it makes a difference, but I don't think it has to do anymore with the artist. I think the artist finishes with the artwork and the framing becomes part of the art. Sometimes the framing takes the attention from the real art. So um, I guess my struggle is that when an artist paints a painting, I don't think they care what happens after that. Yeah. The framing is another piece of art and curating the artwork where it goes in a museum the artist most probably is not always happy with it, but the museum needs to bring audience. So um, I guess with the, especially with the black piece of artwork, depends where you place that. The light on black is most probably harder than any other artwork, how it's reflecting. And so, um, so I think for me, it's more about the emotions that an artwork brings rather than the beauty. Um, at least from my piece of artwork. <laughs> I yeah. always, even if it doesn't necessarily have to be big audience, I feel much comfortable if few people understand what I'm trying to, the message. So artist statements become very important and I'm always against the statement part because I feel like, well, the artwork should speak by itself. But if you bring it to a museum or a place, always the statement takes over and it makes it more interesting because the statement makes you connected to the piece. So I don't know, it's like yeah. complicated. Yeah, definitely. Uh, well, I agree with it, that it, it is the emotional thing that we're all talking about. What I think you're bringing up, which is true, is that the curator sees themselves as an artist. That is, they want to put your painting into the context for the overall effect that they have in mind and you may, as an artist may not even like what they're doing with your piece of art because the context in which they're putting it has you know their own emotional meaning for and and you like wait a minute now this is not where my art belongs i'm sure you've had that experience i remember we had a friend who was an artist who hated the way someone hung her painting it was like felt, she felt it was ruinous and i can imagine yeah the way it gets framed there'd be people who anyway uh, and when I studied the people titling, artists will complain to the museum about the titling, what the, what the you know, curator has said on that. They'll say, no, that throws people completely off. This is not the right kind of thing to say about my painting. So anyway, I'm, I wanna summarize to say, I'm 100% in agreement that you as the painter have your emotional thing you wanna create with that painting. And then it gets engaged by curators, gallery owners, your neighbor, who puts it over the stove. And you go, oh my God, no, don't put my painting over the stove. Um, and all of that. And me as an unsophisticated buyer who um, you're hoping I'll connect with the right things, but you can't guarantee that. I know it's fairly, it must be frustrating to be an artist and not necessarily the right thing. If it moves you in, then I've done my job that, um, I guess it doesn't have to move you in the same way the artist necessarily moves. Great. That's what's the important part, most probably. That's great. That's great. Uh, I'll come to your shows. Oh, I already have. I know, I have a lot of clutter, so it would be the art <laughs> usually lost. <laughs> Um, anyone else? I know we're about uh, we're about a minute away. Uh, anybody else have any other questions? Um, 
David, I just wanted to say thank you so much. It's been, it's been terrific. And I really look forward to the next session. Thank you very much. And Reggie has put up uh, uh, the thing on Shakespeare on the chat. So you can get uh, 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 the book there and uh, a link as well. Thanks, Reggie. OK, great. Uh, great to see you. Next time, we'll uh, do culinary art. Um, but it will be much shorter because uh, the same kind of basic framework. And I think you won't be, well, actually one of the questions is when you eat food and you say it's beautiful, will it be the same part of the brain lights up? And, um, and what is the contextual factors that make a difference in whether you decide it's beautiful or not? And some of it will feel interestingly the same. Um, we'll do that. But then I want to talk about special populations uh, the like what Don asked about. Um, and because um, that gives a richness to um, our understanding of art. Uh, there's uh, people are not all the same. And either at the person who creates the art or the person who consumes the art and um, taking people that are sort of at the extremes. What does it mean to be an autistic painter? What does it mean to be taking, to be an autistic person going to see art? And same with every kind of uh, difference we can imagine. Uh, certainly people from different cultures, I mentioned briefly, but people are really quite different, both at the production of art and at the reception of art. And um, I think that, teaches us some neat things about art and beauty too. Uh, okay, so hope to see you next week. Bye-bye, everybody. <laughs>